with us tonight. We are in the book of the Revelation. If you have your outline, it's going to be instructive to framing our thoughts and our meditation tonight as we are going to be continuing to think through the concept of blessings, the concept of blessings, which we started on Tuesday, We're going to revisit tonight and uh, and work through our second blessing. The proposition I made was that we are dealing with, in the book of Revelation, seven blessings and seven battles. <clears throat> seven blessings and seven battles, and you guys can see that in your outline where we enumerate the battles. Um, the first blessing is given in Revelation 1-3. The second is given in Revelation 14-3. The, uh, the third is given to us in Revelation chapter 16-15. And then the fourth is in Revelation 19-9. The fifth blessing is in Revelation 26. The sixth is in Revelation 22-7. And the seventh is in Revelation chapter 22-14. The concept of blessing is a huge concept, and I share it with you on Tuesday that just like in the Old Testament, there are two Hebrew terms that fundamentally describe what blessing is to be understood as. Objectively, a blessing is when one pronounces upon another person goodwill or good fortune, uh, bounty, <clears throat> benevolence, Increase wealth, honor, fame. That is the inherent connotation of the idea of blessing. So when the Lord Jesus says um, we are to bless and not to curse, the idea of blessing someone then would be uh, audibly expressing to them your desire for them to abound, for them to expand, for them to to grow, for them to enlarge. And literally, that's the idea of the uh, makarios, the term that we're looking at in Revelation uh, chapters 1 through 22. The Greek term makarios um, is the idea of something that uh, abounds or uh, grows or expands. That's the idea. Um, <clears throat> a way to see it is to break up that term in its uh, in its syllable uh, form. The root is the term mac, from which we get the term macro, versus the term micro. Micro is small, macro is what? Large. So when we are blessing people with the Makarios blessing, we are pronouncing upon them a desire for them to enlarge, for them to grow, for them to expand, for them to abound, for them to actually reach maturity. It is also the idea of fullness as well when we talk about the plusios of God, the fullness of God. And Colossians 2, 7 says that Christ is the fullness to nine rather Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily and we are complete or full in him. So the idea of blessing for us is really <clears throat> the idea of God producing in your life and mine everything for which he has ordained us or called us or purposed us to be. That's what we want to work through tonight. The idea of a blessing decreed and then a blessing um, experienced. The way we put it on Tuesday is you pronounce a blessing on someone and then also you observe a blessing in someone's life. Like when you say that individual is blessed. What are we saying? We're saying that we can observe in that person's life a bounty or manifestation of God's pouring into them something by which they are now known more fully and therefore appreciated for what they have. Hence, our uh, tradition at Grace, which is part of the Reformed tradition that goes all the way back to Calvin and Luther and Zwingli and Knox, praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The mental conception you want to get on the idea of blessing as we break into it again tonight is the idea that heaven opens up and pours into your life qualities and attributes and designations by which you become fruitful and become a blessing to others, not for your sake, but for God's sake. So I said it last Tuesday, if God enlarges you, if he expands you, if he grows you, if he matures you, if he develops you, if you experience an abounding, it's not for you, it's for him. The believer needs to know that everything that we are, we are in Christ and everything that uh, we are, he was for us so that the believer's growth or maturity or abounding or gifting, that's what we're going to see tonight, is never for us, it's always for God. There's a sense in which God is expanded when his people are expanded. Does that logic follow? It's a sense in which when you and I become a partaker of the divine nature and we experience the blessing of being in union with Christ, then Christ is manifested through us to others. That's why he would bless us, that he would be blessed through us in the eyes of others. So as we're talking about the seven blessings, and then we're also talking about the seven battles, that's what's in your outline, seven blessings up top, seven battles beneath. Battle one, battle two, battle three, battle four, battle five, battle six, and battle seven. The battle of the white horse, the battle of the two witnesses, the battle of the babe and the beast, the battle of the kings of the east and the earth, the battle of the beast and the lamb, which is where we are in Revelation 17 in our Sunday study, the battle of the king of glory versus the beast, and then finally the battle of the end of the satanic rebellion in Revelation 20. What I want to do tonight is show you the importance of the intervals between the battles and why I think that the each uh, the intervals between the blessings rather and why I think that each blessing uh, has a corresponding relationship to each other the first blessing that we saw is in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 and the next time we see a blessing is going to be in Revelation 14 verse 13 and we will get a chance to work through that tonight as our outline would, I'm sorry, yeah, Revelation 14, 13, as our outline would allow it. <clears throat> but what I want you to think about is the way the book of the Revelation or the Apocalypse unfolds, it's a letter to the churches. So when Christ is speaking to you, he's telling you, blessed is the one that engages in what we learned in verse 3, the reading and the hearing. The reading and the hearing, and we developed that fully on Tuesday. I can't go back over it. It would be too much. But after he pronounces that blessing for those who engage in that model of response to him, you don't hear a second blessing until Revelation 14, verse 13, where in Revelation 14, 13, if you'll pull it up, it says, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth. Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may what? From their what? And their what? Rest, labor, work. Now, we're going to touch on that a little bit tonight. But before we do, this is what I want you to think about. When the Lord Jesus, who is the one giving those blessings, gives blessing number one, between blessing number one and blessing number two, are three battles. Battle one, battle two, battle three. That's in your outline. So now what I want you to think about is you're reading a letter that comes from Christ. And immediately upon opening that letter uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ to John the Apostle by the angel, which God gave to Christ uh, the revelation to signify by his angel to John, and then he goes on to immediately talk about the blessing. And from that verse all the way to Revelation 14, 13, the early church is reading verse by verse. They're reading all of chapter one, all of chapter two, all of chapter three. 
And you know how involved that language is where Christ is in the middle of the seven golden candlesticks. He's the present high priest trimming the lamp, if you will, of the church, that it might burn brighter in the midst of the darkness that the church is in. The menorah is the candle. The candle is the body of Christ. You are the what of the world? Light of the world. In the midst of the candlestick is the high priest and King Melchizedek, Jesus. And what Jesus is doing is polishing the lamps, trimming the lamps, making sure all the debris is gone, making sure the wicks are right, making sure the oil is poured in proportionately to every candlestick. We know that because we know he has spoken specifically to every church. He has given detailed exposition of himself. He has given detailed understanding of the church itself. He has given promises. He has given threats, right? He has acted like a very responsible king and high priest to his church, letting the church know from chapters 1 to chapters 3 before it ends how much he cares for them. And then chapter 4 opens up. And from chapter 4 to chapter 13, they have to deal with a vision. And that vision that they have to deal with is a vision that largely corresponds to battle 1, battle 2, battle 3. Three battles they have to deal with. And then the Lord comes again into the midst of them by his spirit and says, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth. There's a correlation between blessing one and blessing two. And there's a battle that takes place three times before, uh, between those blessings. And I'm not going to develop it. I just want you to look at it. Revelation 6, verse 1, which lays out for us the writer, I mean the, the Lord Jesus, who opens up the seven seals. Revelation 6, 1. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I saw and I heard as it were the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And we read in verse two and I saw and behold a white horse and him that sat on it, and a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went forth to conquer, conquering and to conquer. And then verse three lays out when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And we see in verse four, he went forth. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given him a great sword. So now you got a white horse riding. You got a red horse riding. And now we're about to have a black horse riding. Verse five and six. When I had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Verse six. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four beasts say, measure, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine and next and when he had opened the fourth seal I heard the voice of the fourth beast say come and see we developed that many months ago and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword with hunger with death and with the beast of the earth you can stop right there all four horsemen of the apocalypse are riding simultaneously that's what John saw this is the first four seal judgments then you have the fifth seal and all of a sudden what's going on in the fifth seal the souls of them who were martyred for the cause of the gospel are under the fifth seal and they are the ones that now precipitate the request that God would do something against the evil that came against them for Christ's sake look at verse 10 Revelation 6.10. Revelation 6.10. Okay, you can start at 9. Start at 9. There you go. And when I heard, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now stop right there. If you know we're watching a narrative, a drama, 
a development of a dialogue or a conversation by which in metaphorical and analogical form, we are seeing the church now experiencing the four horsemen riding. And they are the brunt of the war that's taking place with the red horse. They are experiencing the death of the famine that occurs under the black horse. And of course, they're dying as a consequence of the pale horse being there. The white horse is the gospel. The gospel goes into all the world. It saves men and women. They become witnesses for Christ. Ah, but what happens? The enemy makes war against them. And he puts them to death. If he doesn't put them to death first, he seizes their lives and put them in hazards to where they are starving to death. The believer has frequently in the Bible experienced the strategy of the enemy seeking to starve them. And right here with that, that black horse and the scales, you and I can also traject up forward to Revelation 13. No man can buy or sell except he received the mark and the number and the number of his name. What does that mean? You and I are now challenged with whether we're going to submit to an economic system that mandates we worship the state before we can eat, before we can live, before we can survive. That comes under the scaled horse that's black because <clears throat> the presumption of the devil is that all the labor of man is for his what? And like... Uh, like uh, Job's wife said, the way you're living, just curse God and die. This is no life to go through a pain and suffering and sickness and disease, right? But she was thinking very carnally. Life is not worth living if you're suffering. Life is not worth living if you are uh, in straits. Not, life is not worth living if you're sick. Life is not worth living if you have adversaries persecuting you. Is she right? She's wrong. When you don't have a bigger view, you don't understand how suffering can be very redemptive and very uh, pragmatic and very God glorifying. But you have to grow into that knowledge because all of us would be inclined to want to avoid suffering. But what we are learning in the book of the Revelation is that suffering is an essential component to God's glory. And it becomes an opportunity for the believer to prove that he does not love his life to the extent that he would give up Christ. And so he will not love his life unto the death. And they overcame him by the what? Blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. This is what you're seeing in that first battle right there. The gospel goes forth. The enemy goes after the gospel. The enemy traps the people of God. The people of God are suffering now at the hands of the state and false religion. The believer dies, but that's not the end of the story. It never is for the believer. So that's battle one. The believer learns in battle one what Jesus taught in Matthew 24. All of this is in Matthew 24. The white horse and the, and the red horse and the black horse and the gray horse are all in Matthew 24. There will be wars and, and rumors of wars. There will be famine and pestilence. You will have adversaries that will come after you. Many of you will be taken up in the synagogue and beaten and persecuted and what? Killed for my name's sake. That's the first beast. No Q&A yet. Not, try to. We didn't open up in prayer. <sighs> All right, we'll get there. Right, so it's, I'm sorry, it's on my heart. Right? Uh-huh, no, no, you're probably right, but let me, I mean, you are right, but let me, let me finish this framework and I'll do that. So we, 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 are, we are aware that that first battle really is something that Christ is teaching the believer in the church setting. They're in church. They're being taught. They're under the blessing of reading and what? Hearing. Reading and hearing. What are they reading? You're going to suffer for Christ. That's what they're hearing. And this is what the suffering is going to look like. It's going to look like Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 through 9. That's the first one. The second one is Revelation chapter 11, verse 5. Revelation 11, 5. Notice what it says. Revelation 11, 5. This is the second battle that they have to face. It's like unto the first, but it's a little different. Uh, start at verse uh, 4, please. Maybe verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3. Nope. Verse, verse, uh, verse 3. Yeah. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three square days clothed in sackcloth. Verse 4. There are two olive, these are the two olive trees of the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Verse 5. 
And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with plagues as often as they will. Now, I'll leave it right there for a moment. Now, what's going on here? A battle. The two witnesses are at war with an enemy that's coming after them. The two witnesses are the same as the souls under the altar in Revelation chapter 6, 10 and 11. You guys capture that picture, right? They're waging a war. As they're witnessing to Christ, they're waging a war. And here is what we are told in verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall what? Make war against them and shall overcome them in what? There you go. Now we're back to Revelation 6, chapter, verse 10 and 11, right? The souls under the altar. You see the theme coming up again and again? So that's the second battle. And then we have a third battle, even before we get to the blessing, which is necessary to look at. And it's the battle of the babe and the beast, Revelation 12, verse 3. Look at it. Notice this. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. This is the same beast we saw in Revelation eleven seven emerging out of the pit, but with greater clarity as to his attributes. Now, notice what it says in verse four. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it be born. We're in another war. This time the war is more focused on the person of Christ and the dragon state wanting to consume him as soon as he enters into his incarnation calling. It's a battle. And what Christ is doing to the church is letting the church know two things. As you saw in battle one and as you saw in battle two, that you're going through battles. I went through the same battle. At my conception, I went through the same battle. At my birth, I went through the same battle. And this is what he's teaching them. You're going through a battle because I went through a battle because we all go through the same battle. These are three major battles. Now, you guys are very familiar with the terminology going forward because we are now dealing with the beast, beast one and beast two. And now this whore, are we not? All of this is the warfare, saints, that went on between the first blessing and what? The second blessing. This is what you and I want to work through tonight, the idea of blessing. Father, thank you for the saints who have come out. Thank you for the saints who are watching. Help us to pick up now where your word has plainly told us that he that hath ears, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the churches. We pray this with your presence and your power in Jesus name. Amen. So what I would say is that when you look at your outline and we see point number one, our, our blessing number one, and then blessing number two, between blessing number one and two, our battles number one, two, and three. Y'all got that? Battles number one, two, and three. That makes me raise a question, saints, and that's this. How important is it for me to pay attention to the blessings? I want you to, I want you to, want you to work with me now because I'm getting ready to go into this for a moment. How important is it for me, who is an object of God's mercy, a child of the living God and told that I am blessed. How important is it for me to pay attention, attention to the blessings that Christ has pronounced upon me and the blessings that I do possess in light of the battles that I go through? Is that a good question? How important is it for me to capture, comprehend, understand, embrace and benefit from the proclamation that I'm blessed when three-fourths of my experience will be battles. A blessing, a battle, a battle, a battle, a blessing, a battle, a battle, a battle. And watch this. A blessing, a blessing, a blessing, and a blessing. Uh, that's how the book of Revelation works out. I'm going to say it again so you can understand these strategic proportions of tension between blessing and battles. So I'm blessed. Thank you, Lord. 
Ah, but you're going to go through a battle. Okay. Oh, yeah, and you're going to go through another battle. Okay. Oh, yeah, and you're going to go through another battle. Okay. Then I'm going to bless you again. Cool. After that, though, you're going to go through another battle. Then you're going to go through another battle. Wait a minute. I'm going through more battles than blessings. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe if I comprehend the blessings right, that my blessings, by virtue of their intrinsic quality, are so significantly more profoundly important than the battles that I go through, that the battles really serve to augment and manifest my blessings. Does that make some sense? This is what I want to work through with us around the concept of the blessing. That if we comprehend the blessing right, the blessing will mitigate the battles. The blessings will hinder the battles. They will stifle the battles. They will take what the battles are designed to do, which is to destroy us, and those battles will serve to actually accelerate the growth of the blessing. Now I want to go back to define the blessing and work through the idea of blessing number two in our outline. When we said last uh, Tuesday that when we talked about being blessed, it describes the believer, as some theologians call it, in the enviable state of being divinely fortunate. Every believer is blessed in that they are in the enviable state of being divinely fortunate. In other words, God is for you. God is on your side. When you and I say that we are divinely blessed, it means that we have the resources of heaven on our side. That when we say that we have become the objects of God's blessings, we can say with Paul in Ephesians 1, Three, that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies that are in Christ Jesus. And if we can comprehend the blessings along those lines, then we know that we have something that we really need to explore deeply and richly and, and fully since the blessing is designed to mitigate and offset the constant assault that's coming in the context of the battle. Remember what we said largely the way we want to understand the blessing is, is as what, saints? When God blesses us, it means he wants to what? Enlarge us, grow us, expand us. So remember, blessing means enlargement. It means enlargement. It means expansion. Blessing means growth. That's what that means. Enlargement, expansion, and growth. I am going to be blessed in that I'm going to expand beyond my natural intrinsic qualities. That's the idea of being blessed. And then we learned in the first um, blessing that when we talk about being blessed in the context of the reading and the hearing, what is the blessing that comes out of reading the word of God and the blessing that comes from hearing the word read? What is it? Faith. Faith comes by what? And hearing by what? So now, watch this. Is the believer blessed when hearing the word of God faithfully expounded and faithfully taught that he discovers or she discovers she actually, he actually believes it? Are they blessed? Are they blessed in the sense that believing God does something by way of expanding our understanding, clarifying our knowledge, emboldening us to actually draw near to God, equipping us by faith to actually live for God's glory, strengthening us in the hearing of the word so that we overcome our trials because we are believers in Christ. Is that growth? Is that expansion? Is that important? So I want you to get that. So what Christ is saying under that first category of blessing, as we said on Tuesday, the believer who understands the benefit of the hearing of the word of God and the reading of the word of God and the exposition of the word of God, that man or that woman is going to be more likely blessed than other people. Why? Because they're going to be knowledgeable about God's word. They're going to understand what God is up to. They're going to be clear on what's going on in our world. And they're going to be equipped to tell men and women 
what God's will is for all of our lives. The believer who is frequently under the reading of the word of God and the hearing of the word of God is going to be more equipped to be a witness for the glory of God. In being a witness for the glory of God, we now expand God's glory through us. Do you understand that? And every believer that understands that, therefore, will highly regard the mechanistic process of the reading of the word of God and the hearing of the word of God. Because we grow thereby. That's why Peter said, desire the what? Sincere milk of the word that you might what? Grow thereby. The growth is about God's glory. It's not about our glory. It's about a witness to the glory of God. A door open for men and women to learn about God through you. And you and I can't talk about God if we don't know him. Right. Now we move to another very profound area of the enlargement expansion. We've gone from the reading and the hearing. Now... <laughs> I'm going to start right here. You ready? To the dying. I want us to begin to work through this because we, we, it's important to think through the proposition, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Blessed are the dead that die. Now, I think the Lord was wise to give us that particular promise and proposition on the end of three battles because in every battle, guess what believers did? They died. Now, we got to start thinking God's thoughts after him, because that's where we get in trouble. Would you agree that when I don't think God's thoughts after him, I'm inclined to lean upon my own understanding. Yes, and when I lean upon my own understanding, I largely misinterpret what God is doing. Yes, when I misinterpret what God is doing and then I say something like, this is what I think, <laughs> I diminish God's glory. I don't expand it. I don't promote God's glory. I impede God's glory. If I misrepresent what suffering is designed to do, if I misrepresent what persecution is designed to do, if I misrepresent what martyrdom is in the biblical sense, watch this, what God intended to come out of martyrdom could never occur if I fail to operate out of blessing number one. Blessing number one, therefore, is inexorably bound to blessing number two. How can a person be said to have been blessed, having died in the Lord, if they never heard the word read, and if faith never ever entered into their life, and if their life was not built upon the pattern of reading, hearing, believing, reading, hearing, believing, reading, hearing, believing, reading, hearing, what? Believing. They could never be said to have died in the Lord, could they? Right. So there is this book in uh, entry that we want to flesh out for the rest of our hour around uh, believing the gospel and dying in Christ. Believing the gospel and dying in Christ. We've already talked about the expansion that comes from reading and hearing. That's very important. I am what I am today. After 40 plus years of reading and hearing, I am the byproduct of a regiment of hearing the word read, reading the word, teaching the word, hearing the word preached, hearing, hearing it explained, expounded, taught. I am the byproduct of worship week in and week out, worship week in and week out for 40 something years. I'm 60 a couple of days ago. And so it's been 42 years for me. 42 years where, here's what I can say, and I, I ask God to give me grace to finish this way. I might have not been under the regiment of preaching on any given Sunday, maybe once or twice in my life. Now take, for, uh, take 42 years, did I say that? Yep, take 42 years and multiply that by how many weeks in a year? I know we go to government school. 52. Take 52 and multiply it times 42 and tell me what the number is. I'm just talking Sunday. I'm not talking the, the Bible studies that we taught since I was 20 years old on Saturdays or the Bible studies that we taught since I was 30 years old on Friday. I'm just talking Sunday. 
and you begin to understand what I mean by the cumulative benefit of being under the word that long. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? So God's promises are sure and they are true to the person that operates out of them. Now, I want you to get this because I'm getting ready to go into the proposition that dying in the Lord enlarges us. That dying in the Lord expands us. That dying in the Lord causes us to grow. I know that's going to be hard to get, but I'm, I'm hoping I can persuade you that when you die in Christ, you gain. And I want to talk about that. But I, I just want you to understand there's a correlation between dying in Christ and a life consistently operating out of the hearing of the word of God. Y'all got that? All right. So then with that in view, once somebody has done the numbers, raise your hand so I can hear it because I haven't done it in a long time. Miss Prima, what's the number? 2,184 2, Sundays that I have been worshiping God. Missed very few. My kids hollered and screamed because they went through half of them. But it benefited them, too. It benefited them, too. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I can say this. The time went by very quick, John. Very quick. That was a short tenure to me. And I could, if God wanted me to, go through another 42. Is that possible? Absolutely. I have buried pastors that were 100 years old who had been around a long time in the Lord. Um, what a blessing to live for Christ, worship Christ, serve Christ, and die in Christ. Is that the, isn't that the goal, saints? Absolutely. So now what I want to talk about, and the reason I'm milking this with you right now is because I want you to actually have an enhanced uh, sensitivity to the concept of blessing. I want you to get this. Every time that God says you and I are blessed, visualize him pouring water on a seed. And that seed then germinating, taking root downward and bearing fruit upward. That seed is the blessing. The one who cultivated that is Christ himself. His decree pronounced upon that seed makes that seed immutably designated to growth. But it only grows in that particular category of promise rendered. First, there's a promise of growth in the reading and the hearing. Now there's a promise of growth in the dying in Christ. Y'all got that? And then we've got five more to deal with, don't we? And we'll deal with those over the subsequent days to come too. I want to challenge you around what is the expansion? What is the enlargement? What is the growth? What is the fulfillment what is the fullness that comes out of dying in the lord what is the benefit we can say of dying in the lord that's a good question isn't it i mean you and i can talk about the benefits that we have in christ can we not and you should be able to do that you should be able to tell men and women what the benefit is of knowing the true and the living God and knowing him in Jesus. You should be able to list all kinds of benefits. The Bible is full of the idea that the Lord loadeth us, ladens us, overwhelms us with benefits that are given to us in Christ, right? He daily loads us with benefits. And this is what David meant when he says, I will praise the Lord and pay my vows to the most high God because he has daily loaded me with what? Benefits. I was talking to a, uh, a sister earlier today about the importance of counting your what? Blessings. Count your blessings. Count your blessings. Count your blessings, because if you don't, the enemy is going to actually find a way by the negligence of counting your blessings to diminish your clarity on what you have so as to set you up to be tripped up by what you don't have. One of the secrets to being able to continue optimistically in your faith is to be able to count your blessings every day and realize how blessed you are. Got it? How hugely 
blessed you are. All right, what is the idea of the concept of dying in Christ and therefore being blessed? Well, how can we as believers underscore or identify or enumerate? I'm going to give you seven. I'm going to try to give you seven uh, areas in which dying in Christ is of benefit. And you probably can mark some yourself. The first thing that I want to say that when we understand biblically the idea of dying in Christ, you must know that the moment that the believer dies in Christ, the believer, watch this, gains. That's the first thing I want you to know. Upon dying, you gain. Now, what is gain? Gain is actually advancing in something from where you are right now. The idea of gain in a mercantile sense is the idea of trading one thing for another. And in the trade of the one thing for another, you actually gain. That's the idea of gain. And where am I coming from? You should know your Bible. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. Watch what the language says here in Philippians 1, 20. It says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I should be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my what? Now this is Paul talking about how to live. He's talking about how to live. Now will you notice what he says? Now tell me, is this not the benefit of the first blessing? Because Paul read his Bible, didn't he? Paul understood Torah, didn't he? Paul worshiped, didn't he? Because he was a Pharisee. And so that means he did the reading, hearing thing a lot. Paul exercised faith, did he not? Does this sound like faith? According to my earnest expectation and my hope, because that is how you define faith. Faith is the substance of things what? According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be what? Now, do you hear what he just said? My expectation is this, that in nothing that happens in my life will I ever be put to shame. That's huge. Now, he's talking as a living man, as a believing man, under circumstances that you and I probably wouldn't want to be in. Because right now he's in prison. He's in prison in Rome and he's got to face Nero, that crazy man. I'm going to talk about him on Sunday. And what Paul is saying is the grace of God. That brought me up out of my pagan darkness when I was operating under the false high priest of the Jewish Sanhedrin and brought me to Christ has now brought me to Caesar. I'm coming from out of the pagan darkness of apostate Judaism and I'm standing before Caesar now. Now, my journey from the Damascus road of Acts 9 all the way to Acts chapter 27 has been a long journey of which along the way, guess what God did? He allowed me to preach the gospel. He allowed me to go through battles. The beast rose up against me over and over and over again. And here I am now standing in front of Caesar. And guess what my faith says? In nothing do I expect to be what? Ashamed. So along Paul's journey, guess what God was doing? Nurturing and strengthening and building up his faith so that now as he's about to look the beast right in the eyes. And the beast is going to chew his head off. That's Revelation 6, 10 and 11. That's Revelation chapter 11, verse 5 through 7. And the two witnesses preaching and the beast emerging up out of the pit makes war against them overcomes them and kills them that's paul he's going through it right now and notice what the two witnesses are saying because paul's representing that and nothing will i be ashamed but that will all what now this is the term that literally means confidence first of all i'm trusting that i'm not going to be ashamed secondly I'm seeking and expecting that God will grant me the kind of confidence that when I look Caesar in the face, when I look the Roman council and pro council in the face, I will not be distracted by their foul demonic breath. I'll be ready to preach Christ to them like I've preached Christ to everybody else. See, if you know how the story goes, you know that when Paul was waiting in prison, he sent to Timothy and said, Timothy, it's cold. Get me a jacket. Oh, by the way, I need my Bibles. 
Oh, and I need some parchment and some, some paperwork because I'm trying to write while I'm in this cold dungeon. In other words, Paul did not allow his circumstance to distract his identity and his mission. He is a perfect model for us of how God sustains our faith by patterns of life that prioritize Christ. This is what the language is setting us up for in our study tonight. Watch this. He says, I'm trusting that I won't be ashamed, but that with all boldness, boldness as always, so now Christ shall be what? Magnified in my body. Now watch this. I want you to get this. Christ is about to be magnified in my body. His whole desire was for Christ to be magnified in his body. Now, didn't we just say to be blessed is to expand? To be blessed is to grow, to enlarge. Paul only thought that whatever is about to take place, Christ is going to be enlarged. Christ is going to be expanded. Christ is going to be increased in me. You know what Paul wasn't thinking? Paul wasn't thinking about Paul. He was thinking about Christ. He was sitting in that cold dungeon figuring out how, Lord, can I, in my present circumstance, glorify you? I don't know what my outcome is going to be when I stand before Caesar, but based on the historical context that I know, Caesar's really pissed off with Christians right now. Right, because N- Nero is just mad anyway, and he wants somebody to blame. And he's heard about how the gospel has revolutionized Rome. And he's heard about Paul. And he's also heard about Peter. And Peter is only a year and a half out from the same thing happening to him. We'll talk about that on Sunday. And here Paul is in chains designated to stand before the beast. Are y'all hearing me? And here he is saying that I am going to one way or the other. Now watch this. Either Nero is going to let me go. And I'm going to come up out of this dungeon And all the saints who are praying for me and waiting on me and hoping for me and crying for me and trying to feed me. If I come up out of this prison, there's going to be some shouting and some rejoicing and some thanking God for delivering a brother out of the mouth of the lion. Right. But if I don't. And Nero decides to take a bite out of my flesh and the sovereign Lord lets him because he can't do anything that God does not let him do. If Nero decides to cut my head off, Christ will be magnified in this body that will be decapitated for his glory. See it? See it? Now watch the language now, because this is how I want to build on it for us. The idea of blessing, enlargement. He says, whether by life or by death, my desire is that Christ would be magnified in my body. This is where... I say to saints about funeral services because this will inevitably occur. This is how you and I know we got a whole lot of junk going on in our life. So a person will go to church and they study a Bible and they sweaty Christians and that might be all good. As soon as they die, guess what I discover? They want to have their bodies cremated and their ashes spewn all over out of all places on the planet Earth. The San Francisco Bay. (laughs) Maybe. But think this through with me, child of God, before we go on to the next verse to understand, underscore my argument for gaining. Is that biblical? Is that rational? Is that a way to glorify God in your body, which are his? For you and I to enter into the pagan process of cremation, because it is. That's what all pagan countries do. The Babylonians did it. Medo-Persians did it. The uh, Greeks did it. The Gentiles burn up out of convenience to save some money. They don't see the body as being owned by the Lord. They don't see the burial as a witness to the resurrection. They don't see the funeral as an opportunity for the gospel to be preached to the living. They are not thinking God's thoughts after him, are they? So what are you going to do 
to make sure that when you hit the dust, somebody honors you as you honor Christ. Are you just going to let yourself die and then let your family take over? Because I can tell you right now what your family going to do. They're going to cry, weep for you for a minute. Then they're going to go through the paperwork to see whether or not you had an insurance policy. And then they're going to fight and argue over that like a bunch of vultures. And then they're going to do what they can to bury you for as cheap as they possibly could. And it won't have anything to do with glorifying Christ. And that will have been your fault and mine. Because you have no reason to give your body over to somebody else when in fact your body is not yours. It's his. Did you hear what I just stated? It would seem to me that if a person had an opportunity to be Samson, you didn't live your life for Jesus, messed up a bunch of time. Now you're going to die for, for, for playing the periphery. Samson knew it. He's he going to die. But he, he prayed one last prayer. Lord, if you will, let me glorify you in my death. That's what Samson said because he was a great type of who? Jesus. Lord, if you will, let me glorify you in my death. Let me make sure that if I die, I die in a way that brings you glory. So the text tells us he killed more of the Lord's enemies in his death than he did in his life. See what I'm getting at? The idea of you and I having the ability to request of the Lord that our end be such that we magnify the Lord in our bodies, which are his, on a very practical level, simply means that you take care of the business now. So that God can be glorified in your body when we lay you in the grave. You mandate with, with, uh, with what they call that the public notary official. You mandate that you have a gospel preacher and not just some hired professional that will do a soliloquy in some kind of little sermonette and Jesus never gets preached. You pay for the gospel to be preached when you die. Am I making some sense? Right. I've been saying this for years, haven't I? And still, <laughs> Lord, uh, my, uh, you know, uncle such and such, he died. Well, yeah, he been on, he was on the brink of Jordan for the last five years. We knew he was going to die. Why y'all acting like he wasn't going to die? We're all going to die. Blows me away. The one thing we act like is we're not going to die. Can I tell you something? If the Lord don't come, you're going to die. Milking this principle because it's very important. Paul knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to die. I'm very confident of this. When you are in the Lord's will, he'll let you know when your time is up. He let Peter know. Peter knew he was going to die. Paul knew that he was going to face the beast too. And so Paul said, however way I face it, I want to magnify him in my body. Now watch the next verse, verse 21. Here's what Paul says around what I call the blessing of dying. He says, for me to live is what? Right, this is the prerequisite to this next line. The prerequisite to this next line is that a life lived for the glory of Christ can be confident that a life dying in Christ is what? Gain. See it? Gain. Gain. For me to die is gain. When I die, I don't lose anything. I actually gain. To die in Christ is to gain. To die in Christ is to enter into a next level of what? Blessing. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. See, and I, I meant to do this tonight. I meant to mess with your head around this particular category of blessing. I meant to do it. Because that's what Christ means in Revelation chapter 14, 13. For you and I to get a grip on the blessing of dying in the Lord. It's not just some nice thing that God is saying. The implications of dying in the Lord, that is being enlarged, expanding, uh, becoming fuller, fleshing out all of the implications of who you are in Christ in your death. It's worthy of a series of studies. What does the believer gain when he dies 
in Christ. You got it? What does he gain? The literal term now tells you what it is. It's to trade one thing for another with the expectation that what you traded was good, but what you traded for was better. Got that? What you had was gold. My faith is like gold. But what you traded it for was fine gold. It was better. What Christ says about the believer who is in Christ is that your death is a trade off from good to what? Better. Notice what he says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Look at verse 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. I wish I, I could develop that. Paul was very clear on why he lived. He lived to labor in order that he might bear fruit. He lived to labor in order that he might bear fruit. He was clear on every day was an opportunity for him to sow to the spirit. He also understood that sowing temporal things also promised the fruit of what? Eternal things. He knew that. He knew that to sow in this life the right thing was to to merit in eternity other things. This is what Jesus says, right? If you store up treasures in heaven, when you get to heaven, there will be what? Treasures, right? He says, don't lay up treasures on the earth where moth and thieves can break in and steal and they can rot. Store up treasures in heaven. How do you do that? It's a life of faith committed to the glory of God, sowing things down here that have eternal benefit up there. Now, Paul knew that. Paul knew that. Do you understand that? Paul knew. Paul knew this. As long as I'm living here, I can keep sowing into the kingdom. I can keep sowing into the kingdom. And so then the, the moment we move into verse 23, notice what he says. For I am in a strait between two realities. Having a what to depart? Desire. Now, I want you to mark that now. He's saying, I have an epithumia. Epithumia is a term that I use a lot. Epi means a uh, increased, increased passion. Thumia is the term for thermometer. An epithumia is a raising, the thermometer is raising. My passion is raising. I'm getting hotter and hotter for getting out of here and going to glory. Y'all got that? That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm in a straight between two. Here's the two. I have a desire to depart. Oh, there you go. Think about that with me for a moment because this is what I, I want us to really meditate on. Here, Paul is a preacher. He's a teacher. He's a student. He's a brother in Christ. He's an apostle. He's a pastor. He's a bishop. He's a healer. He's, he's all kind of stuff for the body of Christ, isn't he? He engages with the body of Christ in such a radical way that God uses him to write 80% of the New Testament. He's a indefatigable laborer in the kingdom, is he not? He's sown into the kingdom so much that most of us are byproducts of Paul's labor alone. Most of us are Pauline. I love me some Peter, but I know I'm Pauline. The only other person that advances Paul is Christ for me. Because Paul gave his life up to such an overt expression of faith in the one that he came to find loved him when he hated him. He hated Christ and Christ loved him and stopped him on the Damascus road and told him, you're mine, you're mine. Sovereign mercy, putting the chains of grace on a rebel sinner who used to be part of the beastly kingdom. He was an emissary of the false system persecuting Christians. And God said, no, I want you on my team. And Paul never got over the fact that he was a right-hand man to the demonic system of apostate Christianity and God chose him for himself. This is why he could never, ever overcome doing everything he possibly could for Christ. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? 
So when he says, here I am now at the end of my journey in chains, I got centurions around me, I got Gentiles around me, but every time somebody come by me, if they poke me, I'm going to speak Jesus. And that's what he was doing in prison. And the letters he's writing to the brethren in Philippi says, yeah, man, a bunch of folks coming to Christ in here too. In a minute, I got to go see the beast. And he's crazier than ever because all the stuff that went on in his life. So it's quite natural that after 20 something years of ministry for Paul, he's ready to go. He's ready to go. His temperature is rising. He's ready to go. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to enter into my what? My gain. My what? Blessing. I'm ready to enter into my blessing. The Lord told us that there's a blessing for those that die in the Lord. I'm ready to enter into my blessing. So I've just told you the first one is gain. The second one, therefore, is better. Not only are you gaining, you're gaining something what? Better. better. You ought to be curious about that, child of God. You ought to be curious about what it means to die in Christ and gain. What it means to die in Christ and obtain that which is what? Better. That which is better. There's a play on that particular term better running all the way through the book of Hebrews. Christ is a better high priest. He operates out of better principles. He yielded a better sacrifice. You and I are operating out of a better covenant. Filled with better promises, better hopes, watch this, and a better kingdom. So for the believer, better men has everything to do with Jesus. Jesus is the better. He's the better mediator. He's the better high priest. He's the better king. He's the better sacrifice. He's the better covenant. He's the cause of the better blessing. He's the cause of the better hope. He's the cause of the better home. Will that preach? Will that preach? There's a whole lot of, and the, and the Old Testament saints operated out of that better. Hebrews 11 says they look for a better resurrection. Why? Because even the Old Testament saints knew to die in Christ is to what? Gain. To be blessed. To be blessed. So now you and I are getting a little peek into something. We haven't done anything but scratch the surface, children of God. We're getting a little peek into something. Do you know what that is? We're getting a little peek into how the believer prepares himself to overcome the threat of death. You're getting a little peek right now, just a little peek into how a believer can valiantly look death in the face and say, come on. All you're going to do is advance me into my better blessing. Hear it? You're just getting a little taste of it. You're getting a little taste of how theology is designed to take the believer and raise him or her up above the limitations of life, the constraints of life, the pains of life, the difficulties of life, the allurements of life, the temptations of life. Ready? The lies of life. Life is full of lies. It's full of lies. The sprinkled dust of life would tell you that it's worth staying here for some temporal benefit when the Bible is explicit. Immediately upon death, the believer what? Gains. How are you going to overthrow that argument? But you and I overthrow that argument every day in our life. When we don't allow the reading, hearing paradigm to strengthen our faith so that we grow in knowledge, grow in understanding, grow in clarity, grow in conviction, grow in confidence, and then grow in commitment to serve God, as I talked about on Tuesday night. Faith increases your understanding, your clarity, increases your boldness, it increases your confidence, it increases your commitment to serve him. And in serving him, you come to this threshold of realizing the only thing that's better than what I'm going through now in serving Jesus, and I'm so glad he allowed me to serve him, is to be with him. Is to be with Christ. See it? See it? Look at it. For I am in a strait between two. I have a desire to depart and to be 
with Christ, which is what? Far better. Far better. It excels everything that could even be reasonably thought as good and important down here. Like for me, reasonably good and important are my little precious, glorious grandchildren for which I want to stay and be an influential, Christ-centered, God-glorifying papa. I want to be the kind of papa for them that when they think about Jesus, they think about papa. Do you understand that? When they think about the Lord Jesus, I want them to think about the first person come to my mind is my grandfather. Because all I know about my grandfather is he loves me and he loves Jesus. That's what I want to be. To me, it would be worth it staying here. But what I could never say is, it would be better because I even know right now there's an impulse in me that to be absent from the body, which means if the Lord take me, he know how to take care of them when he takes me. So I don't have to equivocate around missing my grandkids or are they going to be all right and, you know, they're going to make it without G. Poppy. If they, don't, if they don't have another 10 years with G. Poppy, now are they going to be able to handle this Leviathan of a world that wants to gobble up my sons and kill them and turn my daughters into some kind of wild monstrosity that does not bear the Imago Day? Y'all understand what I'm talking about? But I'm certainly sure that in the same way God kept me, he could keep them. Now, faith has taught me that. Faith has taught me that. So I'm operating out of a principle, working through what Paul says. He says, which is far better. Let me see verse 24. I want to go into some other blessings. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. This is a huge concession. He's not saying to stay with them is better. He's saying, I'm going to concede because my conceding is for you. I'll stay here for you. Now, he doesn't have the authority to determine that outcome, but he's writing a letter to people that he cares about. And here's what he's saying. I'll stay here for you and I'll forego the far better if it means your benefit. Now, that's a Christ type, too, isn't it? That's a profoundly important Christ type. All right. So we just looked at gain. We looked at the far better. Here's another thing that I want you to see that comes out of the blessing of dying in the Lord and it's inherent in our verse go back to Revelation 14 13 I want to talk about that for a minute the next word here I want you to think about is the word rest the word rest now listen to what he said brother Matt listen to what he said he said and I heard a voice from heaven now when you hear a voice from heaven you can accept it and you can agree with it and you can submit to it because heaven's not going to lie to you and we don't always hear from heaven. Sometimes we hear from hell. We should only want to hear from heaven. Because if heaven talks to you, you can accept every word, every syllable that it expresses. Heaven said, right, John, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from this time forth. Yea, said the Holy Ghost, that they may rest rest so you know what i'm gonna do because that's my job to milk every word of the scripture that my little puny brain can exegete expand expound and proclaim to you for your soul's good think about this with me child of god if god should call you by his grace and quicken you by his spirit and fill you with his word and employ you in his service down here you and i engage in a constant labor of what love and a constant work of what? Faith for the glory of God. You and I are committed to laboring in love and working in faith, which means we are expected to get exhausted and get tired. Y'all got that? But what the Lord tells us is down here, you don't get any vacations. I didn't have a package. I don't have a retirement package for you down here where you retire from ministry and then just travel around the world and go on cruises and vacations. That's not part of my retirement package from Christ. I, I've been looking. I can't find it. <laughs> I can't find it. I'm, I've read Genesis to Revelation over and over again. I'm still trying to find the vacation package. It ain't there. So I presume that until I breathe my last breath, 
I'm called to labor and exhaust myself for the cause of the gospel unless the Lord lays me down some other kind of way. And I'm here to tell you, you can do that whether you are physically laboring or not, because there's always something to do for the glory of God when your head is right. You can write letters. See, with technology today, there's all kind of ways to witness and share and encourage and build up and help people. You understand what I'm saying? You can get on that little crazy thing called a cell phone and you can start calling people and you can just utter a blessing in their life. You can encourage them with a word from the Lord. You can you can use your lips to glorify God. You can use your hands and paint stuff. You can write stuff. You can use your body to honor God even in in micro uh, uh, blessed ways until you breathe your last breath. You can do it. You can serve the Lord until you breathe your last last breath. But when I when we talk about dying in the Lord and resting from our labors down here, the idea of rest is something that you and I want to think through more fully. What does he mean by resting in the Lord? Does it mean that we go to glory and sit on a cloud and the cherubim fly by with grapes and start tossing them into our mouth and fan us? as you know noble kings and queens that have finished their tour no so what do we mean by rest i want you to think with me for a moment about the concept of rest are you ready the concept of rest biblically means to be home the concept of rest scripturally means that the believer, while down here on this terra firma, is never at home. You are never at home. You are always a pilgrim. You are always on a journey. You are always mentally, emotionally, sometimes physically, packing up your tent and moving hither and yon. You are always in transition down here. You are always a stranger on this planet. Now watch this. Even if you don't move geographically, watch this now, the world is moving around you. So even though you're not moving, it's forcing you to be a foreigner because it's moving under you. So every time you turn around, the neighborhood changing. The job changing. Your black and white TV is gone now. Now you got the big screen TV. Now you don't have that. Now you got the cell phone. In a minute you won't have that because the stuff will be in the ether. The world is moving constantly under you. And you got to get used to it because you are a pilgrim. This is not your home. You accept the fact that things are moving. God's moving you. You don't get so caught up down here that you're trying to stop the world. Stop, world. I want to rest. No, God does not mean for your rest to be down here. This is why you look up after a small season of reprieve and you're back in the midst of trouble again. Come on now, because you're on a journey. You are not a resident of this world. You don't get to recline with the kind of safety and security and certainty that is only yours in that other world. Did you hear what I just stated? You don't get to go, I'm going to fix it down here so the enemy never breaks in and steals. I'm going to fix it so that nothing gets old and wears out. I'm going to fix it so that I don't have earthquake, I don't have plumbing problems, I don't have electrical problems, I don't have dishwasher problems, I don't have dryer problems, I don't have car problems. The other day, my crankshaft went out on me. I tried to keep my little old beater for 20 years. I'm one of those cats that just like to keep cars till they just die. <laughs> That's just how I am. I don't like change, okay? I'm just telling you. I don't like change. And the Macar said, man, you, 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 you got to keep it moving. So I had to leave my car right there, right where it was, and go buy another car. I'm not complaining. The Lord didn't bless me. I can go buy another car, right? Yeah. 
But you know what he told me? Ain't no rest down here, brother. Ain't no rest down here. Don't get comfortable in your car. And my car had become a hotel. It was my dressing room, my office and everything. You know how we do, right? Just You just set up everything because you, you and I want to be. I ain't comfortable. I got a brand new car, brother Matt. I ain't comfortable in it. I ain't comfortable. We strangers. Now I got to develop a whole new relationship with a brand new car. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right. And then it came at the most curious time because, you know, I mean, it's getting cold now. I even thought I'm going to fix my own. I'm going to fix this puppy. This is Betsy. I'm going to fix Betsy. I'm going to pull the crankshaft out myself. I'm a mechanic. I could do it. I woke up on Wednesday morning with the thought about going online, finding out how much the crankshaft going to cost. And I got up and I went, whoo, it's cold. <laughs> 34 degrees. And something said, Jess, you show you want to be out there in the yard in 34 degrees. <laughs> I, said, I said, no, I don't think so. I was going to look for a crankshaft. I started looking for a new car. <laughs> and then and did, I found one in 30 minutes. You hear me? Went on out, looked at it one day, bought it the next day, and here I am. I'm back on the road again. I got to get used to Betsy, new Betsy. Now I got to get, I hope I can keep her till the Lord come, right? Because that's just how I am. But there's no rest down here for us. So the idea of rest here that I want you to work with is the rest of the bride finally consummating with her bridegroom. Y'all got that? There's no rest until we enter into that final nuptial state of position number one, face to face. You guys understand that? Prosopropon. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. As Jesus and the father of Prosopopon, face to face, one day you and I will be face to face with Jesus. Watch this. And until we are face to face with Jesus down here, there is no what? Rest. Right. And so this is how this works. We're in Ruth chapter one. Pull it up. Ruth chapter one, verse nine. Ruth chapter one, verse nine. This is where Naomi feeling bad for Ruth and Orpah. Y'all remember that? Because uh, they had lost their husbands because Naomi and her husband had sinned against the Lord by leaving Bethlehem, going down to Moab because it was that was one of those prosperity churches. Moab, they never had problems and people was always blessed in the prosperity church. Right. Grass always green in the prosperity church. The thing they discovered down in the prosperity church was that God doesn't bless you in the prosperity church. So they lost everything. Had two boys. They thought they was going to go down there, start a business and prosper in the prosperity church. First, the husband dies. Now Naomi is in a crisis. But she all right. She got two boys. And you know what they did? They went on down there and married them two girls from Moab. Cute. Ruth and Orba. Cute. Not believers, but cute. You know what happened? The two boys died. Now, all of a sudden, Naomi don't even have anybody to take care of her. She's a mess down in Moab where everything's supposed to be a blessing. All you got to do is decree your blessing. She done lost her boys, lost her husband. And now she's looking at two daughters that are not even Jews, not Hebrews. So we come to discover that Ruth actually paid attention to the preaching that was going on by those knucklehead believers. Right. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, what we often repeat in marriage ceremonies. Where you go, I'm going. Where you live, I'm living. Your people are going to be my people. And where you die, that's where I'm dying. Naomi looked up and realized she had more than a daughter-in-law. She had a daughter. She had a daughter in faith, not a daughter in law. She had a daughter in spirit. She had somebody that stuck closer to her than a brother. Ruth's name means friendship in the Hebrew. And you know what she said to Ruth? She said, I'm going to be honest with you, girl, because I'm going back home. <clears throat> I didn't send enough out here. I'm going back to Bethlehem. 
Plus, I hear that the Lord has visited us in Bethlehem and there's bread there. So I'm going back home. Ruth said, I'm going with you. Here's the problem that Naomi realized that Ruth was a young girl and she had a whole life in front of her. And this is what Naomi said in Ruth chapter one, verse nine. Listen to this. According to the custom, this is Ruth, not Luke. Ruth. Chapter one, verse nine. There it is. The Lord grants you that you may what? Find now start. Now notice what what Naomi says to her daughter. The Lord grants you, grace you, that you may find what? Rest. He's not talking about physical cessation. It's talking about total provision that comes with a man who is able to be what we're learning in our men's meeting, brethren, a provider, a protector, and a producer. That's the Hebrew concept of biblical maleship. Provider, protector, and a what? Producer. Now, when you got that kind of man, man, a woman can do what? Rest. Now, that's who Christ is for every true believer, is he not? Is he not a producer? A pro yeah, producer. Is he not a protector? Is he not, I'm sorry, is he not a provider? Producer. Provider. Protector. Producer. And this is interesting because even in this area of production, what I'm talking about is the blessing that comes in the life of the believer. All these blessings that we're talking about can never occur unless you and I are in union with Christ. Do you understand that? The blessing that comes in your life, the blessing that comes in my life is a direct consequence of our union with Jesus. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. Herein is my father glorified that you should bring forth much fruit, right? and that your fruit should remain. The idea of rest is the idea of you and I no longer being a, a stranger and pilgrim in this world. Yes, Christ provides for us down here. Yes, he watches over us. Yes, he meets out to us necessary blessings to keep us while we go. Would y'all all admit that? But he does it in such a way as to let us know this ain't home. This is not home. You know how the Lord will uh, uh, incrementally bless you, right? You know what I mean by incrementally bless you? You probably don't. Some of y'all will know when I, when I say this. What, what the Lord does with, with people like me, not, not you, but people like me. The Lord does this with me. He will bless me with answering my request one time and then 20 times. He won't pay me no attention. He just won't pay me no attention. All right. So I had to get used to saying, Lord, can I have this? Can I have that? Can I have this? Can I have that? Can I have this? Can I have that? And him like, he don't even say no. He just don't say anything. And I have learned by him not saying anything that he does not mean that for me. Do you understand that? Then, just about when I get used to him not answering my prayers, I said, Lord, can I have, boom, before I even get it out of my mouth, he blesses me with something. I go, whoa. Now my heart is just overwhelmed with joy and I'm like humbled because, Lord, you, you know, I'm just a mess. I'm a wretch. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve none of that. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like the goodness of the Lord just humbles you and just crushes you. And you're like, wow, when he just like immediately, like before you get it out your mouth, like I'm telling you the car, I didn't wait for that car. That car just drove up to my house with my name on it. Right? That's what I'm saying. In years past, I'm looking through the book for weeks trying to find the right car because I'm as tight as you can get. I don't like, I worked on them forever. They not worth the dime that the tires on. Do you hear me? I hate the fact that we have to pay so much for a car. I brought this one and, and it was cheaper than a Toyota, okay? So I'm happy about that. But now I'm, I know I'm getting ready to go back to my regular routine. Do you know what that regular routine is? I'm going to ask the Lord for the next 20 times and he ain't going to pay me no attention. <laughs> Do you know why? Because his goal is to shape my character. Yes. Not to give me things, but to produce in me because he's my producer as, a, as well as my provider, as well as my protector. Am I making some sense? 
His goal is to produce in me stuff that matters to him, like what I'm doing. This matters to him. So that's what he does. He just don't even, he don't say no to me. He just don't say nothing. And I'm used to it now. And you and I have to get used to it too. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each one of you in the house of her what? Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. The next time you read about this idea of rest in the book of Ruth, saints, is in uh, Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. Now look at what it says in Ruth 3, verse 1. Listen to this. Because now all of a sudden, in God's providence, they have bumped into a man called what? Boaz. Now will you listen to what Naomi says about Boaz? Because Boaz checked out Ruth in chapter 2. You do know that, right? passing through the field, running this big, you know, uh, uh, factory on, on, uh, with wheat and corn and stuff. He see this sister out in the field. Now, this sister don't look like nobody else in the field. He knew she was a stranger, but she was noticeable. And do you know how she was noticeable? It wasn't her external beauty. She was beautiful. It was not her external beauty. Boaz was not taken by her external beauty. Because Boaz is a spiritual man. He's not a carnal man. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow morning, fellas. He was, <laughs> he, he was taken back by her work ethic and her commitment to her mother-in-law. See, when he rolled up in his, uh, in his Escalade and called his foreman up. He said, who's that sister down there working that field? And they said, oh, that's Ruth the Moabite. She came back with, uh, with Naomi. Naomi, you know Naomi. Naomi, your kinfolk. And he got the report that she was a diligent, hard-working woman that kept to herself, didn't gossip, didn't get in people's business. I know I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting in your business now. She wasn't your typical woman. Hard working woman. And he said, hmm. And he went over and hollered at her. He told her, I tell you what, sis, just stay in the field here and I'll make sure my men protect you. Don't go to any other field and you're good here. I want y'all to hear that now. I'm not going to expand much, but this is, listen to what he said. If you stay here, you will be all right. You got what I just said? If you stay right here, you're going to be all right, girl. Now, he, it wasn't imperative. It was an invitation. It was an invitation to find out whether or not she knew how to hear from the Lord. Do you understand what I just stated? It was an invitation for him to find out whether she knew how to listen to the Lord and hear through somebody else, God providing the very place that she needed in order for the rest that she longed for to come. See, she could have went to somebody else's field. She could have been greedy for materialism. She could have reaped the corners of the field as the poor woman she was at Boaz field and then went down the street to Joe's field or down to Harry's field afterward. And then the next thing you know about Ruth, oh, yeah, that's the sister that goes to everybody's field trying to get caught. She didn't come into Bethlehem. She wanted to start her own business. And Boaz would have known. That's not the one for me. Because the one for me would have heard from heaven. Because heaven said, if you stay here, it's going to be all good. Do you understand that? Watch this. She goes back home and says, Naomi, I met this brother. He told me if I just stay here, I'll be cool. She said, uh, what's his name? She says, Boz, Bowles. She said, Boaz, Boaz, that's his name, Boaz. And the lights cut on. She said, go ahead and click that corner. She said, Lord, look at what you done done for us. Boaz is our kinsman redeemer. Now, I'm too old to marry Boaz. But this girl right here, let me give her a little piece of advice. This is chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, my daughter. Now, remember what I taught y'all ladies back in the, uh, the women's class a couple years ago? This is Naomi being nice to her now. My daughter. If you go back to chapter one, Naomi's all bitter, all angry, all hostile. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mata. 
She wasn't even calling Ruth a daughter till now. All of a sudden, Ruth then hollered at her kinsman redeemer, my daughter. <laughs> Shall I not seek rest for you? Do you see it? My desire is for you to be fully provided for. See it? Shall I not seek rest for thee? Watch this. That it may be well with what? Think, what does it say in verse 2? Ruth 3, verse 2. If you have one there. Mm, all right, I'll leave that alone. There's another verse in that chapter where Ruth, Ruth is told by Naomi these words in that book. Boaz will not rest until he has done the thing that you have asked of him. Because you see what, what Ruth does? She obeys Naomi and goes and asks for Boaz's hand. And Boaz says, yes. So Ruth says, Naomi says, rest is when you're married. Naomi says, will I not rest until you are married? Now, Boaz is the providence that God has brought for you by which you might enter into your what? Rest. Now, Boaz is a great type of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is our Boaz. You and I are just like Ruth. We're Gentiles. By nature, we have no right in the inheritance. Y'all do know that, right? The Moabites were never to enter into the congregation of the Lord until the 20th generation. How is it that Ruth finds herself not only married to Boaz, she's the progenitor of the Lord Jesus Christ through David's daddy, Jesse, right? Whose father is her child and Boaz's child. You see how grace abounds? You see how God is able to make all grace abound when you are actually operating in God's will. So she's living for Christ, isn't she? She can say what Paul says for me to live is what Christ and for me to die is what gain. This is the idea of resting. You guys, I got a few more before we shut it down. So I want you to understand that when we're talking about the blessing of dying in the Lord, we are not only talking about gain and that could be again a lengthier study than we have time for we're not only talking about better and the idea of better really can be translated as excellent just want you to know that when we get to glory we're going to be entering into that which is what excellent the idea of rest is not physical rest it really absolutely means total provision can you imagine with me can you imagine what eternity is going to be like what it's going to be like to leave this world and enter into that dimension where God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the holy angels are and heaven in all of its perfections. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? The answer is no, right? But you need to start imagining. You need to start using your sanctified mind. And think through with me for a moment the idea of entering into the total provision that comes with Jesus Christ. Let me see if I can push it a little further, just in case you just, I meant for it to be nice and warm in here. I do this for the older ladies so they don't have to just be so cold. You still cold, sis? You good? You warm? You okay? You, you cold? Some of y'all hot, some of y'all cold. Can't, can't solve the hot part. Y'all know that, right? Can't do nothing about that. Still trying to figure out that with my wife. Here's what Jesus said. This is John chapter 14, verse 1. This is what Jesus said. I want you to get this. This is what rest means. This is what Jesus says. He says, let not your heart be what? Right. Down here, you're going to have what? You believe in God. Believe also in me. Now watch the promise. Verse 2. In my father's what? Are many abodes. Literally in the Greek grammar, grammar, massive space. Watch this. My father's house is filled with infinite resource and real estate. I hate using that King James Elizabethan terminology of a mansion because it actually does not do justice to the original language. You and I don't need to be visualizing, you know, a 40 bedroom spot for us. That is as carnal as can get. 
The idea of the abode here, okay, actually means that heaven has space enough for you with all of its bounty to be given to you along with every one of God's elect from the beginning of time to the end of time. Stay with me now. The space that is with the father in his house, in his archonomos, in God's place can capacitate billions upon billions of believers with room for all of the eternal resources that are given to each believer. Now, again, I know we don't know how to really get our heads around it because we're so carnal. I'm talking eternal spiritual blessings of an infinite magnitude, okay? I'm talking the stuff that the eye cannot see or the ear cannot hear or the understanding cannot embrace because it transcends our capacity to understand that level and dimension. It's the stuff that Paul experienced when he went to the third heavens, but he said, coming back here, I can't tell you about it. Because you aren't able to actually comprehend the terminology relative to describing eternity that way. But it is an enormous privilege to know. This is what Christ meant. He says, if it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare what? Please, Please listen carefully to that language. A place for you. So you need to circle that. You need to put stars around that. You need to peg that. You need to own that. You need to meditate on the deep reality that there is a place in glory. Specifically carved out for you. How profound. How profound. See, you need to get your head around that. You, you got to get your head around, like, like you got to get your head around the work of redemption in Jesus. So fixed it that there's a spot in eternity where no one else has a right to it but you. Y'all got that? Like no one else will ever for all eternity occupy that spot. That's yours. In Christ, I am going to prepare a place for you, a position, a portion, a cup, an inheritance, a lot. Do you understand that? For you, nobody else, no angels, no cherubim, no seraphim, not Michael, the archangel, not Gabriel, none of the warrior soldiers, just you. How precious is one of God's elect? How precious is one of God's eternity bound people who believe in him? You, you got what I just said? Now, now watch it. I want you to think this through. He is our Boaz. He is our Boaz. We all individually are his Ruth. Boaz is going to work for Ruth, is he not? Soon as he said, yeah, girl, get on out here. Don't let nobody know you came. Remember? Late at night, she came in the barn, he sleep, right? Down at the edge of the bed. Y'all remember that? That's not a method for getting a man, by the way, but I'm just saying to you, right? <laughs> right, 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 right? And he says, who is this? She says, I'm your handmaid Ruth. I'm glad he, she said it like that. I'm your handmaid Ruth. Cover me with your skirt. That's a Hebrew term for actually cause me to enter into your covenant blessings. He says, I will. He got up that morning. He said, don't tell nobody. It's a secret between you and me. And right now, this is where every believer is. We are in between the secret of the I will and the public manifestation. Do you understand that? It's a secret going on right now between me and Boaz. He would not already taken care of the paperwork. He kicked the other dude out the way. You know, there was the other kinsman redeemer in front of him, right? Do you know who that was? That was Adam. Yeah, Adam, that was my fellow brother man, my fellow. See, you and I are obligated to be our, our brother's keeper. You understand that? The problem is you don't want to keep me. I don't want to keep you. That's one problem. You understand that? We're selfish. Second problem is I can't. I'm bankrupt just like you bankrupt. 
I should love you enough to lay down my life for you, but I can't. I'm bankrupt. And that brother, as soon as he found out that Ruth was in the equation, he said, oh, man, you can have her. And I'm so glad that redemption works out that you and I are viewed by everything in the world as unworthy and worth nothing except to God. Except to God in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? Except to God in Christ. In God and in Christ, you are of infinite worth and value. Worth enough for the son to leave glory, to leave his rest and not rest until he provided a rest for you. This is how important this whole matter of rest is, right? Like when nobody notice you, Boaz notice you. Isn't that crazy? Like when nobody still notices you, you're noticed to Boaz. But you got to get this. There's a secret between you and Boaz right now that you don't get to tell anybody. Like you can tell people all you want to, Miss Holloway. I'm in love with Jesus. They're going to say, good, oh, I don't pay. You're going on with all that old crazy stuff. I'm in love with you. We're going to get married one day. I don't want to hear that. I'm trying to get a job. One day the heavens are going to bust wide open and Boaz coming back. Then everybody on the planet going to find out that they missed out on the rest. They missed out on the rest. See what the Bible says? The wicked are tossed to and fro like the troubled sea. And they can never find rest. Remember what we're learning in the revelation? And the wrath of God will be poured out upon those that receive the mark of the beast. And they will not rest day nor night. But the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. Watch this. No rest for the wicked. All rest for the righteous in Christ. See, this is important, saints. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Dying in the Lord is important. It's, it's very important. You, you and I want to wrap our head around every biblical precept that informs us around this eternal rest. We really do. We really, really, really do. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now watch this. That place that I just said is exclusively to you, John, and nobody else. Now watch this. It wasn't that way in eternity past. In eternity past, God chose it for you before he created the universe. It wasn't that way in time. Ancient history, the Hebrews and the Jews and, and all of the pagan nations. It's not that way now. Right now, that same spot is yours. It'll be yours when you get there and it'll be yours for all eternity going forward. Y'all got that? But that's not the biggest aspect of that work for Christ. He's glad to make sure you have a place there. But if you look at the next verse, this is the most important thing to him. Notice what he says. Now, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again. See that? See, that's the work that Boaz does. And I will receive you unto myself. This is called a reflexive verb. A reflexive verb is the idea of doing something for someone that you are really doing for yourself. You got that? And that's the doctrine of election. The doctrine of election is that God chose us in Christ for himself. That's a reflexive verb. You guys got that? Like he chose you. Yeah, but it's more than that. He chose you for himself. Jesus is going away and he's coming again to receive you for himself. This is all about his desire. His desire for me is greater than my desire for him. Would you agree with that? I am going away and I will come again and I will receive you to myself. Watch this in order. That this is what we call a purpose clause. Here's the purpose of me receiving you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. See it? In the mind of the son of the living God, there is no better place for the purchased product of his redemptive love than for us to be with him. Got it? Safest place in the universe is right next to the lover of our soul. Safest place in the universe is right next to you. This is how important we are to him, Arthur. He's going to scoop us up and say, stay right here. This is right here. This is right here. If you, you stay right here, we good. We good. We good right here. We get to run this whole 
universe. Just stay, stay right here. This is where your rest is, right here. Y'all got it? To be with Christ is far better, isn't it? Far better. It's gain. Far better. It's rest. Y'all understand that? It's rest. Eternal rest. And it's a public rest, too. Do you know what that means? Every demon, every angel, every saint, every re rebellious sinner going to hell will have to look upon the saints of the living God for all eternity, enjoying rest with Christ. That's part of the torment doctrine. Do you understand that? Part of the torment doctrine. This is where, for you and I, we have to have a level of compassion and commitment to the preaching of the gospel to the world. Because the vast majority of the world is going to reject this blessed, blessed proposition that I'm talking to you about. The vast majority of the world is going to reject it as foolishness. They're going to reject it as moronic. They're going to reject it as, as absurd, irrational, and unimportant, Brother Jim. The vast majority of the world is going to say, you can have that pie in the sky idea that has no validity to me. The vast majority of the world is going to reject it, Brother Arthur. But we have to still give it to them. We have to still let them know there's a God on his throne. And he has a son who is the mediator of the world. He's the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And there's no way to the father but through the son. And the son is calling sinners of every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Come. Come to the waters and drink. And we, his bride-to-be, are calling sinners from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Come drink of the water of life free, freely. Whosoever will, let him come. That's what we're saying, are we not? Every day of our lives, we're saying, come. Will you hear me? But ain't no one coming except those who are chosen and called. They will come. One by one. My job as I wait for my husband to come back to bring me into his rest, Brother Matt, is to call sinners to come to Jesus. Come to Christ right where you are. You don't lift a hand. You don't say a word. It's not an altar. It's a thought. It's not a physical labor. It's an inward negotiation in the soul. Right where you are, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If any man hear my voice and the door opens, I will enter in. I will sup with him. I will sit with him. I'll commune with him. I'll give him my eternal promises. It will be well with his soul. That's the spirit of God. Do you understand that? He's been talking like that since the days of Noah. Still doing it today. The reason you're in the house right now is because somewhere long ago, the Spirit of God called you out of darkness and you heard that voice and it drew you near, did it not? Now you're very comfortable hearing the voice of the Son of God in the preaching and teaching of his word. And you and I get to enjoy the secrets, the secrets of the blessings, of the benediction, of the eulogolion. You and I get to enjoy the secret of the blessing of the benediction. One more verse. Look what John 4, uh, 14, 4 says. And wherever I go, you know, and you know the way. Verse 5. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way? And Christ set that question up for these two verses. He says, I am the what? I am the what? And I am the what? No one comes unto the Father but by me. And the believer has been preaching that simple message of Jesus Christ and him crucified for almost 2,000 years. And you know what the Spirit of God has been doing with that? Drawing roots from all over the planet into a nuptial relationship with Boaz. And we're now sitting in this secret waiting for him to come. I got five minutes before I close. There are three other blessed, blessed benefits that come out of it. The other one I just want to call your attention to so you can think it through. One of the blessings of, um, of, of, of dying in Christ is what the Bible calls receiving your reward. 
reward. There's a lot to be stated about that. I do want to say this for the Lord's honor. The believer who is born again and is given grace to live for Christ down here is promised when Christ returns or he or she goes to them to be rewarded. There is something to it that every believer needs to understand. That the concept of blessing in terms of our relationship with Christ down here is that somehow in this relationship that we have in this secret thing between Ruth and Boaz, where we go out into the fields and we labor and we shred out the corn and we call the poor to Boaz's field, somehow Christ is so honored by that that he promises to honor those that honor him. Do you understand that? He promises to honor those that honor him. I'm going to stop here because I got five minutes, but I want to actually press this home on you. In the same way that when we think about dying in the Lord, we gain. And we've talked about that. In the same way we think about dying in the Lord, we get better than what we have down here. We talked about that. And in the same way we talk about dying in the Lord, we get to enter into that what? That rest. Total provision. Here's another idea that you need to understand. The reason for which Christ saved you is for his glory. And this idea of dying in the Lord glorifies Christ at such a level that he promises to reward us. Now, this is exactly how Paul thought about it. Second Timothy chapter four. Verse 7 and 8. Listen to the language. And this is the Paul that's in prison right now. The one who needed a jacket. one who needed his Bible. The one who needed his parchment to write. He knew he was going to die. Here's how he thought about his death. This is what he said. He said, I have fought a good what? That's what we're going to talk about in the morning, men. That's what we're going to talk about. I have fought a good fight. Now, you know what he's doing? He's talking in the past tense. He didn't say, I'm fighting a good fight. Somewhere in my brother's mind, he was done. Somehow the Lord had given it to him. I'm out of here. Right? I told you that's what the Lord will do for his servants. He won't leave his servants ambivalent or going yay and nay. When our work is done, he'll let us know. That's part of the reward. It's time to go home. Remember, Peter said, the Lord taught me how I'm going to put off my tabernacle. Peter knew it too. Peter would die just a couple years after Paul. Okay, y'all got that? Paul first, Peter next. I have finished my course. Now, Paul, how do you talk like that? Unless the Lord revealed to him, he's done running. He's done fighting. He's done running. I have fought my fight. I have finished my course. I have what? Oh, man. See it? Right. So you and I believe in the inerrant, infallible, uh, verbal, plenary word of God. Do we not? Right. I have kept the faith. You know what he's saying? By the grace of God, nothing in this world showed itself to be more valuable than my relationship with Christ. Did you hear that? By the grace of God, nothing in this world showed itself more valuable than my relationship with Christ. Now watch this. And now that I'm on the other side of the fight, like I'm not fighting anymore. Boy, that must feel good. Because I'm still fighting. I'm fighting in my sleep. Did y'all know that? I'm fighting. I wake up in the middle of the night. I got to fight, Brother Mac, before I get up. I'm fighting demons and devils and bad dreams and temptations, even in my sleep. I take my walk with God seriously. If I wake up and I know I'm jacked up. Lord, have mercy on me. I wake up and go, oh, man, I'm glad that was a dream. <laughs> right? You, have you ever done? Woo! I'm glad that was a dream. See, only a few of y'all know what I'm talking about. Man, Lord. And I'm getting used to it now because you know in your subconscious state, you're just all over the map, right? You really need grace. To go to sleep at night. Is that true? You need grace. And you can pray in your sleep. And you can fight devils in your sleep. You can do all that. You understand that in Jesus name. So when you wake up. You can wake up in the Lord. 
I've been waking up in the Lord for 40 something years. Paul, he didn't have to do that anymore. He was done fighting that fight. He was done running for Jesus. Didn't have to run him. Every day I get up running for Christ. I got to do something for Jesus every day. That's my, for me to live as Christ. You understand what I'm saying? That's me. I don't, I don't believe in a day where I just meander and not do something for Christ. That's what I'm alive for. Because I should have been dead at 16 years old. Personally. Okay? I, my, my number was up. Then I came to discover that God chose me for a purpose. So I live every day for Christ. Watch this. I have kept the faith. All of the challenges and temptations and struggles and toils to abandon the gospel, God gave him grace not to do it. And on the other side of that struggle, he can say now, I still believe God. Do you understand that? I still believe God. Look at this next verse. This is verse 8. Therefore, henceforth is what? laid up me for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge shall what give me at that day and not me only but also all them that love his appearing now look at the third line the righteous judge you see that everybody got to stand before the judge on that day according to matthew 16 27 he's coming and his rewards are with him to give unto every man according as his work shall be. Y'all got that? I want you to hear me now. Nobody's getting into heaven without first going through Jesus. No one's going to hell without first meeting Jesus. He's passing out rewards and those rewards will be in correspondence with either a life of grace or a life of works. A life of submission by faith in Jesus Christ or a life of rebellion and disobedience against the Lordship of Christ. In any event, we're all reaping what we sow. Y'all got that? We are all reaping what we sow. Now, what I love about this term reward, because that's actually the translation of the phrase, shall give me. See that little construction? Some of y'all translations will say reward. The righteous judge shall reward me at that day. It's a verb. Shall reward me. It's the metaphor of you coming up, Matthew 25, having been on the right side. I hate to say it. Avoid the left as much as possible. <laughs> okay. I, having, having operated on the right side. Because on the right side are the sheep. On the left side are the goats. That's the Bible. Do what it what you want to. I'm just letting you know the Lord didn't already taught me my politics. Okay. My politics is in heaven from whence I look for my Lord and Savior. And when he comes, I'm looking to be viewed as a sheep who have submitted to the crown rights of Jesus and have tried to follow him everywhere he goes all the days of my life so that when I close my eyes in death, immediately I'm in the presence of the Lord to be absent from the body is to be what and when I stand before him I am expecting like Paul said not to be ashamed I'm expecting him to by his grace give me a crown reward me with a crown of righteousness do you understand that like every believer should be looking for a crown of righteousness that doesn't glorify me, it glorifies him. Everybody gets to watch how Jesus honors those that honor him. Y'all got that? Honoring those who honor him. Just like the president puts the medal of honor on people that have lived valiantly in this life. That's exactly what Jesus is going to do. Please, you, you can't get past that. It matters to Jesus how we live for him down here. It matters that we suffer for him. It matters that we lack down here. It matters that we go through trouble down here. That crown represents the total provision. It represents the total rest. It represents the total package. In that crown, it actually signifies us ruling and reigning with him for all eternity. Y'all got that? 
It's like for all eternity, you enter into your permanent royal status. So there we go. The text tells us in Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth. We looked at a number of the blessings, haven't we? They're worthy of us meditating upon deeply and expecting that one day you and I will be at that point where we will cross over Jordan and we should expect to be able to enter into all these blessings because the God that we serve can't lie, he can't fail, and he won't change. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the saints who come out. Thank you for the saints who are watching. Thank you for the promises of God in Christ. Thank you for our ability to kind of just be nurtured by them. Um, this is the way our mind is transformed, Lord. This is the way our priorities are fixed. This is the way that our hope is built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for protecting us up to this hour. And you've done that, Lord, for so many years. Here we are in the midst of all kind of crazy and we get a chance to hear your word unpacked and see your glory and to enjoy your promises. What a what a blessing you are. You are so good to us, Lord Jesus. You're so good to your people. You've never let us down. Grace us to never let you down. We pray it in Jesus name. Amen.